A new book details the beginning days of the Defense Innovation Unit. Written by two of the agency's early leaders, Raj Shah and Chris Kirchhoff, Unit X tells the story of those who were there to establish DIU, which acts as a go-between Silicon Valley and the Pentagon. One of the main characters is Lauren Daly, who at the time was DIU's Director of Acquisitions, where she discovered how the agency could construct contracts that would be more attractive to tech firms. I recently had the chance to speak with her about it and how everything came together. Why don't we uh, just start from the beginning of, uh, it was kind of an interesting path that got you to DIUX, um, and you know, it's a small defense agency. How did you find yourself in that position that you just mentioned? I had been working in the Pentagon as a member of the Army Acquisition Workforce as a civilian, working in ASALT, which is Army Acquisition Headquarters, for several years. And I had heard about DIUX and was interested in the mission, right? Hey, we're going to try and reconnect DOD with Silicon Valley. And I knew as an acquisition person, that was really interesting to me, right? How do we help engage the way that DOD does business with Silicon Valley. And so I raised my hand, I volunteered and said, hey, I would love to interview for this job, interviewed for it, got it, and then moved from D.C. out to San Francisco. All right, so let's set the scene. You you get at DIUX, as you just mentioned, it is tasked with connecting the Pentagon with Silicon Valley and... Well, and other tech companies will say, but for the purposes of this interview, we'll just keep referring to it as Silicon Valley. What is it that you see as the initial problem and the disconnect between those two entities? Absolutely. So so when I got there, right, I think I was employee like number five or six, maybe. So we were very, very small, still getting commercial internet set up in our office, right? So very scrappy, very startup-like. And for the first, I would say about six months that I was there, our mission was, hey, we're going to go find these really cool tech companies. We're going to connect them back with DoD customers. Magic is going to happen. They're going to work together. It's going to be amazing. And obviously, it's not it's not quite that easy and doesn't work that way. And so what we found was that a lot of DoD customers were very excited about working with these companies and these technologies, but they just couldn't get them on contract quickly enough so that the companies would lose interest or say, you know what, you're not really serious. You're not willing to put your money where your mouth is. We're going to go focus our BD efforts on other clients. And so as the acquisition lead, right, they turned to me and said, hey, we need to figure out a way to actually get these companies money. We need to be able to get them on contract and do business quickly at the speed of business, at the speed of Silicon Valley. How are we going to do that? It's kind of a a different uh, situation for the Pentagon than it's used to because usually it's uh, the companies that they work for rely on the Pentagon for their business. Not the case with these tech companies that are saying, you know, hey, if we don't do business with the government, we'll just go off in another direction. What was it kind of adjusting to that, uh, you know, coming from the Army where you're just such a massive cash cow for most of these companies to, yeah, you know, we might do business with you? (laughs) Well, the way that I thought about it was that DOD has traditionally been a monopsony, right? So the single buyer of things like tanks, aircraft carriers, missiles, right? And so they're used to having all of that buying power, right? And and using that buying power as that single buyer. But when you look at the commercial technology market at Silicon Valley, not only is DoD not the single buyer, but in a lot of times they're not even an important minority buyer. And so you're facing not just different types of technologies that you're trying to buy, but a fundamentally very different market with different market conditions where you're in a different market position, And so you have to very fundamentally change the way that DoD thinks about doing business with these companies and their place in this market in order for them to be able to effectively work in this ecosystem. That brings us up to the point of what we're talking about today. Enter the commercial solutions opening that you were able to discover through pouring through uh, mountains and mountains of acquisition law. Uh, Why don't you tell me about that discovery and actually kind of define that for us as well? Commercial solutions opening is what I what I created for DIU, and it was using OTA authorities, right? Other transaction agreements, which are not new themselves, right? They go back to the to the 1950s, but there was this new language that had come out just that that year that said, hey, if you have a successful prototype OTA, you can move directly into production without having to do another competition. And so that was really attractive and interest, interesting to us, right? Hey, if we find these promising companies and we can prototype and demonstrate their capabilities, at least from a contractual perspective, they can move right to scale to production, right? They can hop that valley of death and scale immediately. So we were really excited about that. But I think it wasn't just that. It was also how do we create a business process that, like I said, mirrors more of what Silicon Valley is used to, right? And there were kind of three fundamental tenets of that that we looked at. One was fast, right? We needed to be able to move quickly. We couldn't take 
12, 18 months to get a particular company on contract. We needed to move quickly at the speed of business. Second was flexible, right? These companies and this ecosystem is used to being able to negotiate contracts, right? It can't be, here's a hundred page government government contract and you have to sign every provision, right? <laughs> we need to be able to negotiate and, and make the contract fit the need of what we are buying. And third, and most importantly, in my mind was collaborative, right? Rather than the government setting, here's all these requirements that we're going to set all by ourselves and then give you the detailed requirements and you have to go build that. We wanted to create an environment where the government could say, here's our problem. And the industry could really come and say, here's all of our different possible solutions, Let's collaborate together to design the scope of work, to design the project. Let's get the people who know the problem best, right? These warfighters in the same room with the people that know these solutions best, the engineers from these companies, and have them sit down together and create what this project is. And that's what the commercial solutions opening allowed us to do. We're speaking with Lauren Daly. She's a senior manager with Deloitte, but former first and former acquisition director for the Defense Innovation Unit. Yeah, you're really speaking Silicon Lang- Silicon Valley's language there because, you know, it, at least from what I've seen and heard about uh, the culture surrounding those tech companies, it's all about action and getting things moving and avoiding that valley of death, as you mentioned. Uh, can you, and I don't expect you to know the litany of them, but were there any projects that sp- stick out that you all were able to help get off the ground using this process? One of the early ones, I believe, was a company called Shield AI that makes these quadcopters that will, you know, fly around inside in spaces and and check things out, right? And this was interesting because it was a company who was actually trying to sell to DOD, right? A lot, most obviously startups are trying to sell primarily to commercial companies. They really knew that they had a DOD use case and they wanted to sell, sell to us, but they were having trouble before they came to DIU about on how to raise money because all of their investors were saying, no, sorry, you know, this isn't a good path to revenue. We're not willing to invest in you because we don't see DOD as a a viable future for a company. We got really excited about their technology, especially in some interesting special operations cases, put them through the process. They competed. They were awarded an OTA from from our CSO. I want to say within a month, it was pretty quick. And after that, and after they were doing that prototype, they were able to take that back to their investors in the venture capital community and say, look, look how quickly we were able to get a contract from DOD. And guess what? There was immediate investment from their investors that came to follow because they said they looked at the CSO process and said, oh, DODs actually can move money quickly and willing to partner with these companies. We as investors will also follow up on that. So that was really validating from you know a dual ecosystem perspective. Yeah, you just mentioned kind of the the feeling around working with the Pentagon changed. Uh, how does how has CSO had an effect on DIUX's mission overall? How happy were your superiors when you you showed them this method? Did it make things easier? And you know, we can if, if you can from an outsider perspective and still an acquisition professional yourself. How what is it? Where is it left DIU today? So, I mean, and you can read about it in Raj and Chris's new book called Unit X, right, where they, they tell the story of this. But once we had the CSO in place, then it was really, you know, floodgates open. We now have a way to actually demonstrate that DOD can put money on contracts in a fast, flexible, collaborative mechanism that it demonstrated we were here to actually work with Silicon Valley. And that really opened the floodgates for all of the work that DIU has done then and and since, right? The vast majority of their projects they put through the CSO still today, and it's spread even beyond DIU to all other components of DOD, which is really exciting to see. Final question, I just want to pick your brain as an acquisition professional, because since the commercial solutions opening is an OTA itself, we've actually got you at a good time because there's a bit of news about OTAs, uh, what with a recent court ruling saying that they might be liable to bid protests. And also a, there's a provision in the most recent Senate NDAA saying that they want to create a committee to study the use of OTAs just because of the rising use of them and the, the way that acquisition press professionals like yourself like to use them because of that simplicity and moving things faster. Uh, what do you see as the future of OTAs? And if, if changes are made to it, is it still going to be an effective approach for the government overall uh, to you know get those uh, 
business deals moving quicker? In my mind, the tool is only as good as the artist using it, right? We've seen OTAs be used really well. We've seen them be used really poorly and can, to the point where they're actually slower than traditional processes. On the other hand, we've seen amazing contracting officers and acquisition profess- professionals use far based contracts in really unique and creative ways that gets them to act quickly and flexibly and work with these kinds of companies, right? 